The little girl was alone in the room. She was sitting on the floor. The walls and her dress were splattered with blood, and the full moon was shining through the window. Her eyes were wide open, and she herself froze in fear. There were also traces of blood on her pretty face. Suddenly the door to the room creaked and opened. A blonde boy appeared on the threshold. He opened his arms to her and was glad that he had finally found her. The baby turned her head towards the newcomer and began to scream. She crawled backwards away from him closer to the window. The guy asked her not to be so afraid. He raised his finger to her lips and called for silence. He sat down next to her, said that everything was fine and promised to protect her. There were tears in the girl's eyes. She just howled and cried. The guy, smiling, carefully wiped away her tears. Then he pulled the baby towards him and hugged her tightly. He affectionately told her that everything was all right now because she belonged to him. Blue sky. There is a forest around. A simple wooden fence separates the small cultivated area from it. A thin girl with dark long hair was choosing tubers from the garden bed and putting them in a rather large bucket. Sometimes she came across stones, but she did not take them, but threw them over the fence onto the road. When the bucket was already full, she tapped the bucket with one of these stones. At this sound, a man in a wide-brimmed hat came out. He waved his hand at her, making some kind of sign. The fragile girl took the handle of the bucket with both hands and with effort tore it off the ground. The heroine of our story could not speak. Most likely the reason for this was fear following an accident in her childhood. She didn't remember that incident at all. She stood with a bucket of tubers and understood that she had to take it to the castle as soon as possible. And she needed to hurry. As she was dragging an oversized bucket along the road, a horseman caught up with her from behind. Stones flew in different directions from under the horse's hooves. The girl turned around at the sound of hooves. The horse was raised on its hind legs by the rider. Out of fright, she dropped the bucket and the tubers rolled along the road. The skinny girl fell to her knees. The rider asked her mockingly what was the matter. He laughed so much that she couldn't even scream. The girl tried to cry and scream. I tried to say words asking for forgiveness and regret. But nothing worked out for her. She held her throat and only opened her mouth. The blonde ordered the maid not to make a fool of herself. After all, she chatted beautifully with her brother Camille more than once. The guy got off his horse. He stood next to the mute maid. He said that he was the firstborn son of the Marquis Lafayette. And I didn't understand why the girl, like all the other servants, was so sympathetic to Camille, his younger brother. Everyone almost idolized the younger gentleman. The elder thought he was too frivolous because of this. He grabbed the thin woman by her long hair. The blonde held the girl by the hair and shouted in her ear that he was the heir here. He threatened her so that she would not dare ignore him, and he pulled her hair with even greater force. Camille ran and called the girl by name. The eldest looked angrily over his shoulder at his brother and gritted his teeth. He told the idiot to get out of here. The eldest duke immediately mounted his horse and rode off into the distance, and the girl continued to sit dumbfoundedly on the road next to her with an overturned bucket and scattered root vegetables. The guy asked Yulia if she was okay. He rode up to her on a horse, got off and stood next to her. He asked if her brother had time to hurt her. Camille touched her face with his hand, and then the girl was able to make at least a sound. She assured the gentleman that she was scared. The guy smiling said that she had nothing to be afraid of, so that she doesn't worry. He promised to always be by her side. He sat down next to her and stroked her head, and the skinny girl looked trustingly into those eyes full of kindness. There were tears in her eyes. She howled and sobbed. She said that thanks to him she remained safe, that he saved her and for that she was grateful. The girl stood up wiping her tears. She told the duke that she had to go because she had a lot of work to do. The guy offered her his help. Julia categorically refused to accept his help. She insisted that he shouldn't have done this, and the guy was collecting root vegetables that had rolled along the road. Camille told the girl that he just wanted to be with her, and I wondered why it wasn't possible. Julia was all flushed but couldn't find anything to answer him. She shook her head, and the guy just smiled looking at her. The action took place in the kingdom of Arcadia. In the blood of the royal dynasty, two ducal families, as well as in the family of marquises, who have served the crown since ancient times, flows the ability called Arcana. Our heroine worked as a maid on the estate of the former Marquis Lafayette. His second son, Mr. Camille, possessed an Arcana capable of temporarily weakening illnesses and curses. According to the doctor, the girl could not speak due to mental trauma. But while Mr. Camille's Arcana was not acting on her, she acquired the ability to speak. So they slowly walked to the castle, happily chatting about everything in the world, and nothing in particular. The guy placed the bucket on the ground next to the kitchen door. Swearing was heard from behind the door. The woman opening the door said the worst words to the girl. But she was stunned when she opened them, 
and when she saw the gentleman, she asked for forgiveness. The guy apologized in response. He said that it was he who caused them unnecessary trouble and problems. He smiled cheerfully at the girl and asked what she would do now. She said that now she needs to wash the potatoes. She asked the cook to wait a little longer with a bow. The gentleman asked the cook to forgive the unfortunate girl, and she didn't understand why Mr. Camille was so concerned about this brainless girl. She promised that she wouldn't let her get away with it. Already at night in her house, the girl was going to rest. Washed clothes hung on a line to dry. The skinny girl sat on the floor and reproached herself for failing again today. She told herself that tomorrow she would try to do everything so that she would not be scolded. After all, she could only cause Mr. Camille problems. But someone with a whip was approaching our heroine's lonely house. She heard these booming footsteps in complete silence. The girl did not know who it could be and cowered with fear in the corner of her wretched home. She thought she heard human footsteps, and she was surprised because it was deep night outside. She waited in fear for the door to open. Soon the creaking of rusty hinges was heard. A malicious smile distorted the guy's already not very attractive face. Mr. Gregory appeared on the threshold of her home in the moonlight. He was drunk. In his right hand he held an empty bottle of wine, and in his left a whip. He lashed with a whip. He said that they were all such idiots and cretins, that they exalted his younger brother, Camille. The guy exhaled anger, and again his whip fell on the girl's back. But she didn't make a sound. He said she was a boring woman, and the girl was lying on the floor near the bed with an overturned chair. Julia thought it was good that she was only beaten, but the Duke's eldest son had never broken into her closet like that before. And now she was scared. She tried to think about Mr. Camille and she felt calmer. The sun was rising above the horizon. Morning was coming. A bucket of cold water was thrown on the girl's head. The cook shouted at the thin woman that she was late, called her lazy. The girl bowed, mentally asked to forgive her. The woman ordered not to piss her off. She ordered the girl to quickly wash it and pointed to a full bucket with dirty dishes. Julia grabbed the bucket and went to wash the dirty dishes. The cook wondered why the girl was so awkward and clumsy. Another said that usually such people were fired, and this usually alarmed her. The third asked to stop washing the bones. She admitted that when she listened to them, she herself began to get angry. The guy who came in thanked the maids for their work. The girls were surprised to see the young gentleman appear in the kitchen. He smiled and charged all the kitchen workers with his energy. Camille said the dinner was great, therefore I came to personally thank you for this. One of the girls said it wasn't worth it. It was known that Mr. Camille looked in on the maids from time to time. He thanks them, although he is an aristocrat and is not obliged to do this. The guy was simply wonderful, and here all the workers adored him. The young gentleman wondered where Julia was. The head cook pursed her lips in frustration. She couldn't understand why he wanted this girl. I couldn't believe that Mr. Camille could like her. But then she thought that he was interested in Yulia, because she could create a mess, that he didn't see her and became worried. The guy asked the cook to bake brioche for the girl. She hesitated. After all, she would bake as much as she wanted for Mr. Camille, but it was too much for this girl. She said that you should not waste butter and sugar on a maid. This could anger the gentleman. After all, even she, a kitchen worker, only takes leftovers for herself. The guy calmed her down. What if someone asks? Let him answer that it was his order. He left and waving his hand said that he was counting on her. The maids were bustling around in the kitchen, and the eldest above them smiled sarcastically in anticipation of the nasty thing she was planning. Julia went to the door. She brought a bucket of clean dishes. The door to the kitchen opened with a creak. Her thin face appeared in the doorway. And then the head cook threw soup on her head, for which the girl worked tirelessly. She angrily said that this was her food. She ordered her to get out. The maid smiled, looking askance at the thin woman. They laughed at her, but she didn't understand what was happening around her. She stood there holding a bucket in her arms and with the remains of soup on her head. And there was laughter all around her. She didn't understand. Had she made a mistake again? She wanted someone to explain it to her. And I didn't understand why she caused nothing but problems. She wanted to just disappear. I told myself that I shouldn't cry. She swallowed nervously with offense. I told myself that I needed to finish my work as soon as possible. The girl washed the floor, wiping it with a rag. Mr. Camille looked through the kitchen door. He gasped quietly at the sight of the girl. He felt a shiver from this cutie. The full moon was shining in the sky. The girl sat in her closet on the floor and analyzed her day. It turned out that she angered everyone again. And in the end, she remained hungry. She was very hungry. Remembering those evil, twisted smiles, she imagined them splattered with blood. And the evil eldest son of the duke, and the malicious cooks. She clenched her fists from excess. She promised herself not to make such mistakes in the future. And then tomorrow everything will be fine.
The door lock clicked. Mr. Gregory entered. He mocked the maid for causing trouble again today. The girl became even more sad, realizing that the gentleman was here again. He told the mouse to get out of the hole. He promised, smiling evilly, that he would teach her how to do the right thing. He gave her a resounding slap in the face. Then he grabbed her tightly by the hair and threw her face down on the floor. The girl remained lying there. Then the guy took a bucket of water and poured it on her. The girl screamed and begged the gentleman to stop, but her voice did not betray a sound. Gregory asked if she wanted to chat with him. He accused that she and Camille simply conspired against him, and he asked how long they planned to make a fool out of him. He narrowed his eyes angrily. The mute girl sat on the floor all wet, shaking with fear and cold. Gregory swallowed nervously. He insisted that she was infuriating him and kicking her, proudly walked away, leaving her lying alone on the cold floor of the closet. Julia was crying. She consoled herself that at least she was still alive, but she didn't understand why she even lived. The old maid was combing the young master's hair. He told her that he was going to have lunch with Julia today. Therefore, I asked to prepare two servings. Camille reported that this girl does not like to sit still within four walls. Therefore, I asked that lunch be served in the garden. The woman was surprised. The guy continued to give orders. He asked to bring grape juice for Julia. After all, he doubted that she would drink alcohol. The old maid was surprised. After all, no matter how high the position a servant occupied, it was unthinkable to dine with the master, especially for this girl. She believed that among the servants, she was the most senior and honored worker of the castle. But she couldn't remember a time when Mr. Camille would call her by name. The gentleman asked to fulfill his request. The woman replied that she would obediently carry out his order and went to the kitchen. She said that Mr. Camille wanted to dine in the garden. She asked me to cook something simple for two servings. The cook asked her about two servings. The maid confirmed that he heard everything correctly. She explained that Mr. Camille would have lunch with Yulia today. The guy was surprised, and the maid insisted that she didn't like it either. The head cook listened silently, clenching her teeth. She agreed that they served the masters for so many years, but they're not something to dine with, and they even disdained to call him by name. And it was not clear why this girl should enjoy privileges. The cook thought that that girl was simply pathetic to look at. After all, she doesn't understand anything and can't say a word. And Mr. Camille simply felt sorry for her. The maid agreed with the cook's opinion, considering her to be right. But Mr. Camille's order was undeniable. The cook ordered the others to continue working. And by the way, I was wondering where Julia had gone. The cook replied that it seemed the girl had to tidy up the pantry today. The cook had an idea. She walked towards the storage building. One of the door wings was open. Julia was just wiping off her sweat. She finally finished her work here and I was going to take a short break for myself. The cook stood outside the door and angrily watched the girl from around the corner. At some point, the door creaked and slammed shut. Julia noticed this and was surprised that the door closed on its own. She went to open it, but no matter how hard she tried, nothing worked. And then I realized that I was closed from the outside. I couldn't understand how this happened. It turned out that someone didn't notice that she was inside. She also admitted that this could have been done on purpose and the cook walked away from the pantry contentedly. Julia thought that now it's not so important how this happened, but she hoped that someone should have noticed her. She pounded on the doors with her fists as hard as she could. Booming sounds were heard throughout the area. Tired and with broken knuckles, the girl sat down under the door. All her efforts to draw attention to herself were in vain. She was sad that no one heard her, and all she could do was wait until someone came to take something from the pantry and open the door. It could happen tomorrow, or it could happen later. Tears began to fall from her eyes. The key clicked in the lock. Our heroine immediately jumped to her feet. Finally, light spilled into the storeroom from the street, blinding the girl's eyes, already accustomed to the darkness. The cook angrily asked the mute woman why she was hiding here. She wanted to answer that she was locked here and shook her head in response, unable to make a sound. The cook gave Yulia a resounding slap in the face, yelled at her that she was just a useless girl. She said that Mr. Camille himself invited her to lunch today. The girl held her cheek, which was burning from the blow. She looked confused, like she didn't understand what they were talking about. The woman yelled that she didn't have to pretend, and I was amazed at her behavior. Turning around, she said that after today's dinner, the girl should clean the table alone. She reminded me that the dishes needed to be washed, the cutlery cleaned, the ashes removed from the stove and the floor cleaned. The cook told the girl to do all this alone, that she significantly spoiled Mr. Camille's mood, and she got off too easily. Julia was surprised that Mr. Camille invited her to have lunch with him. After all, this has never happened before. But if they were telling the truth, 
then what she must have done was simply terrible. It was already night outside. The Duke's castle and the entire estate were illuminated with starlight. The girl was washing the floor with a mop. Suddenly a young gentleman entered the door. He was surprised that she was working alone in the kitchen today and asked where everyone else had gone. The girl asked Mr. Camille for forgiveness. He couldn't understand why. Julia insisted that she did not know that he had invited her to have lunch with him. There were large tears in her eyes. The guy smiled back at her. He assured her that she didn't have to worry about it. I realized that she must have been very busy at that time. The girl denied being busy, and she tried to explain that she was locked in the closet, but he interrupted her without listening to the end. The guy consoled her, asked her to be quiet and not cry. He assured that no matter what her reason was, he still wasn't angry about it. Julia said that it was so kind of him, and she, Camille didn't let me finish, but simply hugged the skinny woman. He spoke comforting words to her and touched the top of her head with his lips. The guy looked at the girl and smiled. He admitted to himself that he liked her even when she was crying closed in the closet, and he was glad that he was not disgusted with Julia. Tears rolled down from the girl's eyes. She asked Mr. Camille why he was so kind to her. He stroked her head and thought she was cute. He called her by name, considering her only his. The sky was already turning scarlet. The guy asked the maid if she was working hard. She assured that everything was fine. She just couldn't speak. And she had no one to talk to. Julia said that she only causes inconvenience to everyone. And for this, she often has to apologize. Camille offered to intervene in her life, but the girl was sure that she should not have bothered him. Julia insisted that she wanted to cope on her own. She was sure that all the people here were actually good. She was going to work harder and be useful and she believed that she could not constantly rely on the help of Mr. Camille. The guy became serious. The guy asked the skinny girl not to say such sad things. His blonde hair was blown away by the wind in a long tail. Julia's face was surprised. She tried to ask the gentleman a question, but he silently drew her to him, hugging her. The horned moon only witnessed his caress. The guy told her quietly that he liked her. The girl found it strange. Camille assured that she herself noticed his attitude and feelings towards her. But Julia pushed him into the chest with her thin hand. She said that this couldn't be done. She reminded him that she was just a simple servant on the estate of his duke father. The guy was deep in thought. He was surprised that she was bothered by the difference in their social status, and that he belonged to the noble Lafayette family. The guy reminded that he was only the second son, and he will not inherit either the title or the fortune of their family. Camille insisted that he had nothing but a noble name. Julia asked him not to say that, she assured Mr. Camille that he was a wonderful person. She talked about his kindness and care for a simple servant. The girl assured that he was dear not only to her, but to everyone in this estate. The guy thanked her. He said that he could not ask her to accept his feelings while he was in such a precarious position. Julia looked at the gentleman offended. He asked her for forgiveness. He insisted that he did not want to burden her with his feelings. He only asked her to remember that he values her very much. The girl drew his attention to the fact that it was already completely dark. Camille reported that he would walk her home. He assured me that it was dangerous to walk alone at such a time. His older brother Gregory was watching them from behind a tree. He told himself angrily that this girl dared to ignore him and give preference to his brother. The skinny girl stood in front of the window in the moonlight. She was already dressed in night clothes, and she remembered the words of recognition of Mr. Camille's feelings. She touched her face and reassured herself that he was just joking with her. After all, she was an ordinary maid, and now she couldn't even speak and I didn't remember my past at all. She was sure that Mr. Camille's disposition towards her would not be enough, and I didn't want to be deceived. But even if his words were not serious, she was still pleased to hear recognition from such a wonderful person. She asked herself if she could allow herself to be happy for just a little while. A vase fell to the floor with a clang and broke. The guy shouted that they were all such idiots. He said that he, Gregory was sure that everything in this house belonged to him, and this girl also belonged not to Camille, but to him. He knocked on the closet door with his foot. He ordered the maid to open it. Julia recognized the voice and shuddered. She assumed that he wanted to beat her again. The guy appeared at the door, illuminated by the moonlight. The girl had a silent question on her face. It seemed to her that he looked somehow different today. Gregory narrowed his eyes. He grabbed the maid by the clothes, and he began to reveal her cleavage. Silent horror froze in the eyes of the victim. The guy leaned on her with his whole body and knocked her to the floor. She wanted to scream for him to stop but he grinned evilly. He assured her that he would make her remember who she belonged to. Gregory tried to tear off Julia's clothes. She begged him to stop and hot tears flowed down her cheeks. The girl tried to scream. The guy's hands slowly slid down her waist as if burning her with fire. 
The eldest heir to the dukedom grinned, amazed that the girl was trying to resist. Even Yulia's unsuccessful attempts to free herself turned him on even more. He pressed her to the floor, as if the girl was some kind of thing to him. Hope faded in the girl's eyes, and tears flowed like a stream onto the bed linen. He began to talk about his status as an heir. He assured how untalented the girl was as a maid, and made a dirty compliment to her tear-stained face. Promising to find a use for her sweet face, he tried to tear off her light dress with a sharp movement. She mentally begged the master to stop. In the silence of the night, the knock of the duke's youngest son, Camille, was heard. He tenderly called the girl's name, hoping that she was not yet asleep. At that time, Gregory jumped in surprise and cursed. He looked around warily at the sound, and a spark of hope flashed in the girl's eyes. Camille, standing under the closet door, continued to call Julia, saying that she had forgotten her scarf. I asked if she was still sleeping. The skinny girl mentally called on Mr. Camille to help her. She pounded her foot on the floor, attracting his attention with a dull sound. He asked her permission to enter. The younger gentleman burst through the doors. His noble silhouette was reflected in the moonlight. What he saw horrified him. His brother Gregory held the frail girl lying on the floor. She resisted his efforts to remove her clothes. Camille grabbed the rapist by the scarf and pulled him away from the girl, lifting him up. I screamed in his face, asking what he was doing. He asked him how he dared to even think about such a thing. He condemned him for allowing himself everything only by right of birth. The guy believed that Julia was the same person as them, and the skinny girl hid in a corner and cried, curled up into a ball. Camille did not understand how his father, mother and brother were not able to understand such a simple thing. The older brother's face became distorted. He didn't understand how it was possible to compare this dirt underfoot with people of noble blood. He said that his words were crazy. He considered the girl just a thing that belonged to his family. He was sure that he would be the one to dispose of his inheritance and maids as he pleased. Camille turned to his brother, trying to appeal to his humanity. But he growled, broke free, and ran into the darkness. The younger duke called the girl by name. Julia responded, calling Mr. Camille by name. She was crying and shaking all over with fear. The girl pressed herself into his chest and cried bitterly. The guy pulled her close to him and hugged her. He asked her for forgiveness. Meanwhile, Gregory sat on the sofa and trembled all over. His heart was ready to jump out of his chest. He closed his eyes. It was hard for him and his brother to argue. The door creaked and light spilled into the dark room. Camille entered and waited at the threshold, while his eyes adjusted to the darkness of the room. My brother was sitting on the sofa, shaking all over. At the sight of the newcomer, he bared his teeth in anger and muttered his name through his teeth. The booted foot tapped next to the coward's head. The guy asked to tell him what he was going to do with Yulia. Camille was cold and determined to deal with his brother for the incident in the maid's closet. The coward looked into his eyes pleadingly. The guy said that until that moment, he had gotten away with all the abuse of the girl. But now he did not agree with his brother's claims to Julia. I thought that it wasn't enough for Gregory to just have fun, and so I suddenly wanted to make the girl my own. The coward only made inarticulate sounds in response. Camille said that you shouldn't steal anything from him. The brother knelt and asked him to forgive him. He said that he realized his mistake. Gregory crawled on his knees in front of his brother like a reptile, and his brother stood over him like a menacing mountain. A kick was made to the head. The guy tried to dodge his brother's boot. He asked to think about whose grace he was still the heir. Camille said that it would be easier for him to take this title away from him than to take candy from a child. Gregory's head was still under his brother's boot. He said he was wrong, and he swore that this would not happen again. Camille said that of course this would not happen again, and he kicked his brother in the lower jaw. The long-haired blonde stood with a straight back. I asked my brother not to forget that he was still dancing to her tune. I advised him to continue dancing, and then he would allow him to remain the heir of the family. Gregory was still on his knees. Camille asked if his brother understood everything, and looked back at him over his shoulder. He just nodded silently in response. The guy walked along the corridor of the mansion. He was going to have another glass of wine. It seemed strange to him that there was light leaking from under the door. Opening the doors a little, he looked through the crack. Green liquid was pouring onto the floor. There was also a towel, raw vegetables, fish, and meat. The cook, with a satisfied face, poured wine onto the floor. In her other hand, she held a lantern. She told herself that that girl didn't even know how to work, but despite all this, she was the only one in a special place. She could not understand why Mr. Camille favored Julia, and the guy stood quietly with a sad face. Everything was clear to him. After all, Julia was the last one to leave the kitchen, and now this maid was going to blame the whole mess on the girl. Camille thought the cook was an idiot. He was going to get wine from the pantry, and on the way back he decided to look into the kitchen and grab cheese. 
he came to the conclusion that the more attention he paid to Julia, the more jealous the idiot servants would become, and the more often they will mock her. And it was the same story with Gregory. It turned out that he was harassing Julia, beating her with or without reason just to vent his anger. After all, the older brother felt that Camille was superior to him in many ways, and these actions were his way to feel more confident. The guy was sitting in a chair and drinking wine from a glass. On the table in front of him stood an open bottle, cheese and grapes. It was like a vicious circle. He cared about Julia, so the servants bullied her, and Gregory took out his aggression on her. And the deeper she plunged into this loneliness, the more dependent she became on his care. The guy recalled how she clung to him and needed hugs and affection. He sipped his wine and remembered how sweet she was, his Julia. The kitchen workers who entered were horrified by what was happening there, and everyone turned their attention to the fragile girl. The cook angrily asked if it was her doing, remembering that she was the last one to leave the kitchen yesterday. The girl herself was surprised. The girl agreed that she was the last one to leave, but she probably left the kitchen in perfect order. The young master looked through the kitchen door and wished everyone a good morning with a smile on his face. The servants all turned around at once. The guy stood with a bottle of wine in his hands. He said that last night he borrowed wine and cheese from here, and now I've come to return the open bottle. The cook was surprised that the gentleman himself decided to bring it. I assured him that he could ask the maids about it. Camille was sure that there was only more work and everyone was busy. Besides, I wanted to invite Yulia to dinner. The guy looked through the servants deep into the kitchen, looking for the girl with his eyes. He asked if she'd already come here. Seeing the mess on the floor, he pretended that he was seeing it for the first time and asked what it was. The cook insisted that they themselves did not know. After all, all the kitchen workers just came here themselves. He told the gentleman that Yulia was the last one to leave the kitchen yesterday. The girl stood with a guilty and confused face. Camille was surprised, and she insisted that the mess was clearly not her doing. The cook asked how the gentleman knew this. The duke's son answered that last night. When he looked for cheese, there was not a speck of dust here. I assumed that Julia had already finished work by that time and left. Camille was sure that something was going to happen later. Perhaps someone got in here and deliberately created this mess here. He admitted the idea that someone maliciously wanted to frame Yulia, who was the last to leave here. And this someone clearly hated her. The cook pressed her lips tightly and looked away to the side. Our heroine stood sad. Camille assured that they had no time to look for the culprit. And I thought it would be bad if breakfast was delayed. He assumed that his mother could swear. The servants unanimously agreed with him, and the guy rolled up his sleeves and assured them that he would also help them clean up. The cook tried to dissuade the gentleman. Camille admitted that he was not particularly good at cooking, but he could cope with cleaning. He picked up dirty towels from the floor. He said that he would wash them first. Julia looked at the gentleman pleadingly, but he held the once white towel tightly. He assured her with a smile that everything was fine. He insisted that he knew very well that it was not she who did it. The girl knew that she was not the one who made the mess and spread the dirt in the kitchen, but she still believed that the blame for what happened lay with her. It turned out that she was the one who made someone hate her so much, but she could not understand why, while everyone was angry with her, Monsieur Camille remained so kind to her. The guy invited her to clean up together. Julia mentally asked Mr. Camille to forgive her for being so spoiled, and the cook looked angrily at the sweet couple. Her trick didn't work, and she clenched her teeth tightly in anger. Camille noticed these sidelong glances at the girl. He knew very well who arranged this, but didn't tell her anything. He thought that this idiot would be very easy to control. Julia was wiping the kitchen floor dry. Then she carried the large barrel out of the room. She said she had already caused enough inconvenience for everyone. She was soaking dirty towels for washing. She told herself that Mr. Camille was very indulgent to her. Julia believed that this could not continue. I told myself that I had to work even harder. She hung up the white towels and wiped the sweat from her brow. The girl remembered the words of confession of feelings, and this made her feel good. For these words alone, she will try her best. And the angry one looked after the skinny one. Mr. Camille was drinking tea. He asked the head maid where he could buy clothes for a girl from a non-noble family. The woman asked again and wondered why he needed this. The guy clarified that we are not talking about a festive outfit or a work uniform. He was interested in what ordinary girls wear on weekends. The maid, surprised, asked if the master was going to give clothes to that stupid girl. She reminded the guy that he was the son of the Marquis Lafayette, and it was not proper for him to show special attention to some maid just because he felt sorry for her. Camille was sure that the girl was the same person as himself, and if he should look down on Julia just because of her background, this means he should have changed his attitude towards his interlocutor. After all, 
just because she had a certain power over all the maids of the estate, at the same time she did not cease to remain a maid. The woman stood there like a schoolgirl being reprimanded. The guy took the maid's hand. He said that, however, he himself had never hired servants to handle furniture. And from now on I didn't want to think differently. Camille realized that the woman cared about him more than about herself, and he couldn't admit the idea that she was somehow worse than himself. The maid tried to object to the master, but he interrupted her. He insisted that he just wanted to be polite to those around him. He wondered why his father, mother, and brother could not understand this. He said that he was counting on at least her understanding. The woman looked ashamed. The guy suddenly took his senior maid by the hand. She was surprised by Mr. Camille's affection, and he gallantly kissed her hand like a knight showing honor to a noble lady. He said that he had been taking care of Yulia lately because he saw that she was having a hard time. But the nanny was dearer to him than anyone else. A teapot and two porcelain cups were placed on the table. The woman thought about the master's words. She realized, of course, that he was always too kind. But his words today confused her a lot. The woman even blushed from such thoughts. But then she turned around. She said that you need to control yourself. And it was time to return to work. The cook came in. She asked for forgiveness. The head maid asked her what happened. The girl asked permission to meet with the mistress. She claimed that she needed to tell her something. The woman was surprised that the cook could tell the Marquis such a thing. She said that the kitchen worker couldn't just run to her mistress right away. She advised her to first contact her boss. The girl assured that this concerned Mr. Camille, and in another case, she would have turned to the boss. She assured that in any other case, she would have done so. But now she must be sure that the mistress will know about everything. After all, Mr. Camille will most likely prefer to remain silent out of his kindness. The woman carefully asked what was the matter. The maid hesitated, searching for words. She claimed that that worthless girl forced Mr. Camille to help her with cleaning the kitchen. It was simply outrageous. It was amazing that the son of the Marquis Lafayette cleaned the kitchen himself. The maid said that this was unacceptable. She will not allow Mr. Camille to be insulted in this way. An arrogant woman with tightly compressed lips and an eternally dissatisfied look entered the kitchen. The cook and two cooks were surprised by her unexpected appearance in the service room, where usually only servants were present, and the gentlemen did not deign to show their noses here. The cooks greeted the lady in surprise. They asked how they could serve her. The lady was accompanied by a pleased cook and a senior maid. The Marquis screamed in rage, ordering that this dirty mongrel Julia be brought to her immediately. The cook stammered and accepted the order. Then a thin girl came in. All the servants stared at her with angry looks. The guy roughly grabbed the fragile girl tightly by the hand and dragged her. He told the lady that he had found Julia. The girl was also surprised by the appearance of the Marquis here, and she tensed, not understanding what they wanted from her. The woman ordered the offending maid to be taken away from here. The servant answered her obediently. The man soon dragged Julia by the hand. She had no idea about the reason and had no idea what she was about to experience. The servants in the kitchen were all noticeably despondent, and only the cook, who started all this, grinned maliciously. Camille was sitting at the table and reading a book. Suddenly the door swung open. Brother Gregory came to see him. He was excited and screaming. The guy asked why he was yelling like that. I was surprised that he didn't even know how to knock. Gregory yelled, Trouble, Julia! A man's hand rose with a whip and pointed it at the girl's thin back. There was a click and another scarlet stripe cut into the tender flesh forever. There were tears in our heroine's eyes. She didn't understand why she was being punished. She wanted them to at least tell her the reason. The man had previously received orders to punish the girl with a hundred lashes, and then the girl should have been thrown out of the estate. The lady's order was also conveyed to ensure that Julia no longer came into the sight of Mr. Camille. But the girl didn't know all this and wondered. One man told another of the servants that he would leave everything to him, and he ordered not to even think about feeling sorry for the offender. The skinny girl lay exhausted on a pile of prickly straw. She was worried that she would never see Mr. Camille again, and that was the worst thing for her. This sent another whip through her heart. The Marquise sat and sedately sipped tea from a porcelain cup. A guy stood in front of her, her youngest son. She asked if he knew why she called him. The woman affirmatively reported that servants for aristocrats are convenient and accessible tools. And her son not only thought of surrounding the servants with his attention, so even now I washed the floors next to them. I thought it was incomprehensible. The lady was sure that her son's behavior was not worthy of the good name of Lafayette. The guy coldly asked who reported on Yulia. Camille was sure that the girl in this house was hated more and more. He thought that if he gained the favor of the servants, then no one would treat her badly anymore. But it did not help. The guy asked his mother to forgive him. He promised her that he would be more careful in future. 
His mother answered him rudely, telling him to get out of her sight. Camille answered her timidly and obediently. He realized that he could not yet get rid of his mother so easily, and he will have to curry favor with her for some time. And in such a situation, he didn't know how he could keep an eye on Julia at the same time. There was a choice to use servants or Gregory. He did not want to allow him and Julia to be separated. A guy in ragged clothes was sitting under the wall when a covered wagon arrived. The man pulled the fragile girl out by the leg. There was a dull sound of a falling body. The carriage drove away, disappearing into the darkness, and Yulia, still conscious, remained lying on the road. She mentally asked not to leave her here alone. She tried to figure out what to do now. After all, she was aware that it was clearly dangerous to stay here. Julia decided to hide somewhere. She found the strength to get up and hobbled to find a safer place. But she didn't know where to go. Her legs were shaking. She wanted to call someone for help, but she couldn't. Her back, cut by the whip, was bleeding. Tears streamed down her cheeks. She mentally asked Mr. Camille to come to her aid. A carriage drawn by a pair of noble animals was passing along a cobbled street. The horse's hooves clopped rhythmically. The guy abruptly stopped the carriage when a girl suddenly jumped out into the street. The gentleman got out of the carriage and asked in a dissatisfied tone why they stopped so abruptly. The coachman asked for forgiveness and explained that a man just ran out onto the road. A tall brunette in a military uniform and coat went to take a closer look and saw a skinny woman lying unconscious on the stone slabs of the road. It was a girl with long dark hair and simple and shabby clothes. Her blouse was stained with blood on the back. The noble gentleman was horrified. He took the light body into his arms. The coachman reported that there were slums nearby, and he assumed that the girl could be from there. The gentleman joined his guesses. The girl's back was still bleeding, and fresh marks remained on the man's hand. He couldn't understand that this could happen to her, and he decided to take the girl to the estate. Camille was surprised when he learned from the maid that Julia had been driven away. After all, he thought that she was just being punished, and that's all. The woman with a guilty look said that the mistress ordered the girl to be whipped and then expelled from the estate. She told that shameless woman rightly so. After all, this girl clearly forgot her place. It was outrageous to force the gentleman to help clean the kitchen. The guy's face was tense. He grabbed the maid by the throat and pressed her against the wall. The woman was wheezing. She could not breathe. Camille threatened that if she did not return Julia back to him, he promised to kill her for it. The maid gasped in fear and began to wring her hands. The guy believed that Julia's world began with him and ended with him, and there should be nothing in it except itself. He wondered what would happen when the girl saw life outside the estate, and he was ready to go after her this very minute, but did not want to incur the wrath of his mother. And it turned out that on the one hand, if he started searching for Julia right now, the implementation of his plan would have to be suspended. On the other hand, while he hesitated, someone else might have suspected something was wrong, and he couldn't allow that to happen. The woman dared to ask Mr. Camille why he was killing himself so much for the sake of that maid, but the guy was already opening the doors. He only briefly said that this girl belongs only to him. The waning moon was shining in the night sky. The eldest son of the Marquise walked resolutely with a whip in his hands. Having caught up with the servant, he asked who carried out the order to punish the maid Julia. His face was twisted with anger. The man asked again. Gregory said that there was no one else but him, and narrowed his eyes angrily. He was sure that he had beaten and thrown out the maid Julia from the estate. The guy swung at the servant in rage. The man answered, stuttering, but was interrupted by the blow that fell on him. Again and again, blows rained down on the servant's back. His white shirt was stained with scarlet blood. The ducal son was pleased with the result. He said that if the servant doesn't want to die, then send the girl back quickly. The man turned over his shoulder. He tried to argue that the mistress ordered, and he could not disobey her. But Gregory was adamant. The Marquise's son was silent. He took out his anger with a strong kick to the servants already lashed back. Gregory sat down next to the servant. In his hands, he clutched the handle of a whip. His face was like the grin of a predator. He was sure that the servant knew exactly where the girl was thrown out and advised him to play on it. And if anyone asks where he left it, he suggested answering that the gentleman have it on Gregory, and he believed that there could not have been a worse punishment. And he was sure that if he answered like that, no one would blame him. The tall trees of the garden looked more like an impenetrable forest. The weather was clear and sunny. Our heroine opened her eyes and sat up in bed. Everything around her was foreign and unfamiliar before. She tried to understand what happened to her and where she was now. While she was wondering what kind of place this was, a young man entered. He smiled friendly at the girl. I was glad that she was finally awake. Julia didn't know who this man was, a tall brunette with sharp but sweet features. He was clearly of noble blood. 
He asked how the girl was feeling, and after a pause he was very surprised. The girl only now realized that the stranger did not know that she could not speak. The man asked about her muteness. Julia nodded. He asked if she could write, but she just shook her head negatively in response. Disappointment appeared on the brunette's face. Our heroine did not know what to do, and she thought that she shouldn't have disappointed her savior. The man apologized. He assured the rescued girl that he had no intention of reproaching her for anything. With a confident movement of his hand, he pulled a chair next to her bed and sat down next to her, smiling welcomingly. I asked her permission to introduce myself first. Julia concluded for herself that this man clearly had a high position in society, and I thought that he sat next to me out of politeness. The owner of the estate said that his name was Glenn de Westris, and that he bears the title of Duke of their country. Our heroine could not understand why such a person took care of her. He said that he had recently passed near a slum, that she jumped out onto the road right in front of his carriage, that she did not respond at all, and then completely fell, losing consciousness. The man believed that it was all because of those wounds on her back, and he couldn't leave her in this state. So I decided to take it with me to the mansion. Glenn said that she lay unconscious for three days. He was sure her back still hurt, and asked how she was feeling. The girl thought that everything was fine now, but could not answer. The man insisted that she shouldn't have been shy. He warned that the doctor would come soon, but before that, he wanted to ask her a few questions. But since the girl could not speak or write, what could she do? And Glenn rubbed his chin in thought. It wasn't that there was no way at all, but he didn't want to use it. The man thought that first she needed to refresh herself, and soon a tray with warm soup and cutlery was ready. The maid bowed and smiled, and said that since the girl had not eaten for several days, she advised her not to rush, but to chew slowly and monitor the sensations. The skinny woman folded her hands as if for prayer and sank into herself. In front of her was a tray with a plate, spoon, and napkin. Glenn looked at this in surprise. The girl slowly brought spoon after spoon of soup to her mouth. The man noticed her manners. It couldn't be said that they were perfect, but it was clearly noticeable that she knew about etiquette. Meanwhile, our heroine was wiping her mouth with a napkin and he was surprised how a girl from the slums could be well-mannered and so sophisticated. He wondered who she was, but she herself didn't really know who she was. In the darkness, the envious cook approached Julia's closet. She opened the door with a creak. Mr. Camille stood at the window and thought. He gasped in surprise. The girl approached him. She said that she expected to find him here. After all, he came here every evening. She hugged the gentleman from behind. She spoke kind words to him. She assured him that she would console him. She asked Camille to forget this Julia, that that girl and she too are just servants in the Lafayette house, and their lives are controlled by the gentleman. But the guy's face was gloomy. The cook assured that the master had the right to do whatever he wanted with her. The guy answered, Okay. He assured that he would do so, and with a sharp swing he struck the girl in the face with his hand. A second later, the envious woman was sitting on the floor, and blood was dripping from her broken nose onto the floor. Confusion was written all over her face. Camille insisted that it was she who reported it. He said that he didn't know her name, but he remembered that ugly face well. He put his foot on the cook's shoulder. She covered her head protectively. There was a powerful blow again. Camille assured that he was not going to forget Julia, and it is not for the servant to tell him what he should do. His foot was on the maid's head. He assured that such an ugly person as she did not dare to tell the master who to forget. Camille called her disgusting, throwing another kick. Blood splattered on the floor and walls. He shouted that Julia was his and only his. Soon the guy walked through the doors into the night under the light of the full moon, and the envious cook remained motionless on the floor of that closet. Camille asked into the darkness where his Julia was now. He quietly called her name. The young maid was horrified by what she saw, and the doctor just chuckled busily under his breath. The bare back of the rescued girl was visible to their eyes. On it, scarlet inflamed scars were visible from the lash. The doctor asked the girl to turn her front towards him and open her mouth. He asked her to tell him something, but she just silently opened her mouth like a fish. The man said that everything was clear to him. He said that he was already done for today. He recommended thoroughly rubbing in the prescribed ointment and not forgetting about the bandages. He advised her not to overexert herself too much. The girl bowed thanks and at the same time accepted his advice. Soon the door slammed behind the doctor. Glenn asked the doctor his opinion about the health and wounds of his charge. He said that deep scars would most likely remain on his back, and very unpleasant ones at that. However, no bones, muscles, or nerves were damaged, and in everyday life her injuries should not have manifested themselves in any way. The Duke was saddened and leaned his back against the wall. The doctor continued, 
As for the girl's voice, it didn't seem like the problem was related to the vocal cords, and he assumed that this could be a consequence of mental trauma or fear. But in this case, he could not help in any way, because the case was also old and neglected. Glenn was deep in thought. A man in glasses and a white coat suggested that this girl did not grow up in the slums, and the Duke added that he also noticed this himself, that there was no rudeness in her demeanor, and he would even say that she behaved with some dignity, that you don't see this with those who grew up in the slums. The doctor assumed that the girl could have simply been left there after those brutal wounds were inflicted on her back. Glenn realized that this girl still had a place to return home to, but then he thought that if she was left in the slums, it was unlikely that they would be waiting for her at home. He remembered how the girl called him brother. She complained that he never told her his name, and she invited him to come again. He offered her tea and asked if she liked sweet scones. Her sweet face was forever etched in her memory, and now it seemed simply impossible to meet her again. A week later, when Glenn entered the girl's room, he was simply dumbfounded by what he saw. The girl was wiping the glass of the windows, and the window frame now simply sparkled clean. He reproachfully asked her what she was doing. The girl looked back at the man with caution. She fell at his feet. Glenn assured that he had no intention of being angry with her, but he believed that she did not have to work. Our heroine looked up at him. She didn't even think that he was angry, but she believed that servants should always bow to their masters even in the presence of aristocrats. Glenn assured that if she was injured, then she should not have strained herself and cleaned the room. But the skinny woman believed that she had already caused so much trouble for the man. That's why I wanted to help at least with what I could. And then she felt absolutely healthy, and she began to wave her arms, demonstrating her activity. Seeing that they were not listening to him, Glenn grabbed the girl in his arms. She didn't expect this at all. And then his face was so close to hers. The man carried the skinny woman onto the bed. He said it was too early for her to leave the room, and put him to bed. He reproached her. He asked how she was going to recover if she didn't follow the doctor's orders. Glenn assured that until the doctor himself gave her permission, it was worth listening, to lie down and rest properly. His finger poked her nose instructively and gently. The man's appearance was menacing, and his gestures were feigningly harsh. But the girl began to show with gestures that she needed something to write on. The man guessed, but asked her about it. The girl nodded in response. Glenn asked what she suddenly remembered and was a little intrigued himself. He took a notepad and an ink pen from the table. Soon our heroine, sitting on the bed, was already drawing something on paper. Glenn looked over her shoulder curiously. It was a bird only for some reason she has two heads. Then it dawned on the man. He guessed that it was a double-headed eagle. The girl nodded contentedly in response, confirming the correctness of his guess. The next guess was that his ward was from the house of the Marquis of Lafayette. The girl nodded again to the man, smiling. Some kind of devilry was coming out. The Marquis of Lafayette values purity of blood and position in society most of all. He was incredibly proud of his pedigree, which began simultaneously with the founding of the Kingdom of Arcadia and it was easy to understand that he despised those below him and simply flattered those above him. He was a powerful man in his own right. His wife was a cruel woman. The couple considered the workers of their estate only tools, and if the gentleman didn't like something, then they could whip the maid without hesitation right at the royal ball. There was a bottle of wine and a glass on the table, and several pieces of cheese on the plate. The duke recalled that the marquises seemed to have several children. However, they never appeared in society. He reasoned that in any case, the offspring of the Lafayette couple should have a character to match their parents. And if this girl worked in that Marquis's house, then up until that moment she was treated cruelly. His ward was even touched by the fact that she was being treated and that she was being fed. She tried to work despite the painful wounds on her back. It turned out that the thin woman was flogged and then thrown into the slums as punishment in the hope that she would not survive here at all. The man thought that if the girl was tormented so much, then why was she so glad to hear the name Lafayette? Her look seemed to say, I want to come back as soon as possible. This nonsense could not fit into Glenn's head. He wanted to know what this girl was thinking about, and he was sorry that they could not understand each other. He looked at his hand longingly. A plate was thrown onto the floor, and it shattered into fragments with a clang. The woman asked herself how long he would fool her. She covered her face with her hands and cried. The boy silently entered the room. He tried to close the doors behind him just as quietly when he left. When he walked along the corridor with a girl, he asked her, Why does his mother cry all the time? And why doesn't dad come home? The boy had tears in his eyes. Suzanne answered the young master that her father was a worthless man, that he was not fulfilling the duties of a duke, and he easily spent all his money on women and gambling. 
His mother tried with all her might to draw her husband's attention to his family and children, but it was no use. And the crying woman only cursed his mistresses. The boy asked why neither his father nor his mother came to see and visit him. The girl said that the young master himself would understand everything when he grew up a little. He began to cry, and Suzanne hugged him and gently said that he had her, and everything would be fine. The boy agreed to this at least, and thanked the girl for her understanding and care. Suzanne was one of his father's mistresses, but the boy managed to become attached to her and love her with all his heart. But she told his mother about his father's adventures, driving her even more into despair. And she told his father about how cruelly his mother treated her son. And thus the girl fueled mistrust in the gentleman towards his wife. She not only got along with the boy, but also won the trust of the gentleman, the boy's father. And it was also Suzanne who was the first to discover the mistress's body in the pond and raised a cry throughout the entire mansion. And thus Suzanne, having removed the obstacle, was finally able to achieve her goal. Soon she became the Duke's wife officially. It turned out that the girl never really cared about Glenn. For her, he was just a tool for gaining power. He concluded that all people were disgusting, that they are willing to do anything to get what they want. Therefore, Glenn has not used his lasso since the day it appeared. He only had to look into a person's soul to see its ugliness. And now the man was afraid to be disappointed in this girl too. After all, her real intentions were unknown to him. And if he uses his ability and finds out that this cutie is essentially no different from Suzanne, that she is just as two-faced, will he be able to bear it? Glenn could have easily found out the intentions of the girl he saved, but he was afraid. Suddenly she turns out to be just like Suzanne, two-faced. Julia struggled to carry a mountain of clean plates. The man called out to her sharply. He began to reproach her for taking up work again, and Julia was now putting clean linen on the closet shelf. Glenn grabbed her, wrapped her in a sheet, and carried her. He said that she did not obey the order to rest. The skinny girl sat obediently like a doll on the bed, unable to move in the sheet. Glenn took off his gloves. He understood that the girl simply could not sit in one place. He still decided to use the lasso. Otherwise, the girl will clearly simply overstrain herself from working hard. The man looked into the eyes of his ward. He wanted to know at least a little more about her. His palm rested on the girl's head. He heard her thoughts that she was glad that he finally smiled. Julia thought that Mr. Glenn was as kind as Mr. Camille, that he also stroked her head, although she did nothing to deserve it. She thought she couldn't sleep all day long, and he wants to thank the Savior in some way. The man admitted to himself that he did not see even a hint that the girl was hiding something. He was sincerely surprised that such people even existed. Glenn asked the girl if it was true that she was so tired of sitting in one place. The girl nodded her head and thought that she would like to repay the Savior for his care. And I just wanted to be useful. And then, having thanked the Savior, she wanted to return to the Lafayette estate. She was sad that Mr. Camille was probably very worried about her. The girl thought that she had to tell the master as soon as possible that she was fine, and apologize for making her worry. She so wanted to see Mr. Camille. The man apologized. He understood everything that was needed, and he promised to give her two instructions. Firstly, she will help in the kitchen for one hour a day. The girl was hanging clean, washed towels on a rope next to the kitchen, and then I washed the fresh greens. A kind and friendly kitchen worker came out and gently told the girl that that was enough for today. Julia bowed low at her feet. Glenn's second order was to come to him for tea. The maid was combing the girl's long hair, and our heroine sat and reasoned self-critically that not only did she not know etiquette, but she also could not answer, and therefore she was afraid that the man might seem bored with her. Glenn stood up at the sight of the girl and met her standing near the set table with an open smile. He invited her to come closer. Julia blushed all over. She herself didn't know why she suddenly felt so flushed. On the table there was a teapot, cups, and a plate of sweets. Our heroine looked sadly at all this and was afraid of doing something wrong. The young man, seeing her indecisiveness, assured that he had always disliked formalities, so she didn't have to worry about manners. Julia was surprised that Mr. Glenn noticed that she was embarrassed, and I thought that it was necessary to at least touch the food so as not to seem rude, and she began to drink tea. She was surprised that it turned out to be so tasty, and the helpful and friendly maid slipped a whole tray of sweets right under the girl's nose. Julia enjoyed the taste of the baked goods, stuffing her mouth full of it. Glenn called their tea party an errand, hoping only that she could relax, but things turned out differently. The Duke said that the girl had a crumb stuck to her and wiped her face with his hand. The man smiled, and for him this time turned out to be unexpectedly pleasant, as well as for our heroine of the story. The man in the pince-nez reported to Mr. Glenn. He reproached him for not listening to him at all. He apologized to Simeon. 
The blonde said that if something bothers him, maybe they should have dealt with this before they moved on to other things. Glenn agreed that he was right, and the assistant announced his readiness to listen to the master. The man asked if there was someone named Camille in the family of the Marquise Lafayette. The blonde insisted that this was the name of their second son. The gentleman asked to tell me what he knew about Camille. The man slowly took out the book he was interested in from the shelf. He replied that the couple had not yet introduced their sons to the world. Glenn was surprised, having guys reached the right age for this yet? But his assistant said it wasn't a matter of age. After all, the eldest heir of the family was also not introduced to society. His name is Gregory de Lafayette, and he is 23 years old. And Camille was 20 years old. Glenn was sure that it was quite unusual for young people of their age to still be out in the world. Simeon assumed that perhaps this was the situation in their family. The Duke was lost in thought for a long time. The Lafayette family traces its history back to the founding of their state. Surely nothing is more important for both the Marquis and his wife than maintaining their status. And the sooner they present the heir to high society, the more stable his position will be. And Glenn could not understand why the couple hesitated to introduce their sons to the entire aristocratic society. He asked the assistant if the Marquis of Lafayette had a lasso. He confirmed this. After all, he was a descendant of an ancient family, and it seems his abilities were related to healing. The eldest son was supposed to inherit this ability, but it seems that the lasso could pass to their youngest son, Camille. And if we assume that the lasso was not passed on to the eldest son, the heir, it was with Camille, who had no right to inheritance. A complex and incomprehensible situation emerged, and in this case, the most ancient and noble family of Lafayette must face serious difficulties. If Glenn's guess was correct, then it turned out that by postponing the debut of their sons, the Lafayette couple was trying to preserve the dignity of the family in the eyes of others. But this was only a temporary measure. The Duke asked Simeon to find out more about the Lafayette family. I thought there was something unclean there. He promised that he would do everything right. Glenn walked through the garden and led the girl by the hand. She was thinking. I asked myself what Mr. Camille was doing now. He was the only one the girl could talk to. The man could not believe that she could seriously think about this Camilla all day long. So reading her thoughts, he learned that the girl's name was Julia, and that the only one who could hear her voice was Camille. He assumed that the lasso belonged to that guy. There was simply no other explanation. And yet if he could hear her, then why didn't he stop all the bullying against her in the bud? Ever since Glenn first read Julia's thoughts, this was all he could think about. He did not want to believe that Camille knew perfectly well that the girl was being bullied and only pretended that he did not notice it. Glenn also suggested that Camille himself deprive the girl of the opportunity to speak. He walked next to her and touched her, stroking her head. And she only dreamed of returning to Mr. Camille as soon as possible. The man was aware that his ward herself wanted to return to her former master in that damned house. And as soon as she recovered, he would have to let her go. But there was no way he was going to do that. After all, he did not want the girl to be hurt again, but wanted to protect her. He dreamed so much that she would not remember Camille with such warmth but him. The man touched her hand unobtrusively. Julia looked into the eyes of her savior, and he understood that he could also hear her voice, but he was afraid that if she found out that he read her thoughts whenever he wanted, she might hate him. The guy in the hood carried a lit lantern in his hand and went down the stairs. The door he opened creaked. In the room where this door led, books were scattered on the floor, and cryptograms were drawn in the middle. Camille placed a red artifact stone from the bottle into the center of the star. It lit up with a faint glow. The guy carefully sealed the rest of the minerals back with a glass stopper. Our heroine was sitting in the garden on the grass in the company of Glenn. Today he decided to have a picnic for her. Nearby stood a basket of pastries and drinks. Yulia was eating something tasty on both cheeks. The lady in the red dress looked at it all from the window. The maids in the kitchen whispered that Madame Suzanne had not come to see her master today. The other answered that she had not been with the gentleman for three months, that she stopped even pretending and the owner became an empty place for her as soon as he transferred his title to Mr. Glenn. The girls discussed that Mrs. Suzanne's priorities immediately changed. She was not related to Mr. Glenn. So if he decides to get married, then Suzanne will lose her place as mistress in this house. The lady hit the wall with her fist out of anger. She swore at the girl, who charmed her stepson with her simplicity, childish spontaneity and openness. She noted that Glenn had never touched a girl with such tenderness, and she couldn't understand how that ragged woman managed to seduce the man. Suzanne believed that everything was due to the fact that this old man came down with an illness, but still managed to transfer his title to his son. But she told herself that she had not yet enjoyed enough of the luxurious life of the Duchess of Vestris. 
This was all she had been chasing after the old duke for so long. Suzanne couldn't contain her joy when the woman finally died, and this became her fatal mistake. The boy noticed her pleased face, and since then, Glenn has distanced himself from her. But if he still avoided women, no problem would have arisen. After all, while he was single, the place of the mistress of the Vestris house belonged to Suzanne. She pressed her lips tightly and cursed, not understanding what could have happened. Glenn, who hated and despised people for their insincerity and girls in particular, suddenly he showed interest and had a nice time with this person. She told herself that she would never allow this to happen, and opening the doors, she resolutely walked out. Walking down the corridor in heels, she said that at any cost she would throw this girl out of here. Suzanne was sure that the place of mistress in this house belonged only to her, indisputably. With her face twisted with anger, the lady went down the stairs. She saw a sweet couple below. Glenn introduced his guest to his mother. He offered to say hello to her. He insisted that ignoring the Duke's guests was the same as insulting him. Suzanne decided not to let Glenn turn against her. She greeted the girl sweetly with a smile. She said that she was glad to see her in their house. Julia politely bowed her head in response, and the lady noted to herself that if her stepson ordered her like a duke, she could not help but obey. And now she didn't even know what to do. Now how could I get rid of this girl? A pillow fell to the floor. Suzanne was irritated by everything. She didn't understand why on earth she should now grovel before some nameless simpleton. She was looking in her head for an opportunity on how she could get rid of this girl. And soon she had a great idea. Glenn didn't show much interest, so she completely forgot about it. She sat and wrote a short letter on paper with a quill pen. When she finished, she smiled with a satisfied and malicious grin. The addressee of the letter read the message. It was strange that Glenn at first avoided women and all people indiscriminately, and then he had the audacity to drag some girl into the estate. Another letter said that the addressee knows that Gregory's arcana is called Curse, while Camille's arcana is Liberation. After reading this, Glenn stated that he did not want to rely solely on this document. The assistant in the pince said that he was very sorry, but there was very little information on this issue. The gentleman was sure that the reason for this was that the brothers did not appear in public. The man was sure that Gregory's lasso raised certain questions, but he had even more suspicions about Camille's abilities. After all, if we assume that Julia cannot speak due to the curse, then Camille's lasso was supposed to destroy it and return the girl's voice once and for all. Let Julia speak again next to Camille, but this did not remove the curse from her as such. Apparently this ability only temporarily deprived him of his strength. Glenn wondered whether such a lasso could even exist. He checked with his assistant about the lasso of the Marquis Lafayette, which had the ability to heal. It turned out that his capabilities were limited, and besides, the Marquis's health had been deteriorating lately, and he hardly appeared in public. But at the same time, he still refused to introduce his heir to society. It was strange for a person to put his family and his blood above all else. Glenn suspected something fishy here, but I still couldn't understand what exactly. He couldn't understand, and he wanted to protect Julia from danger, but he knew almost nothing. They knocked on the door and asked for forgiveness for disturbing me. They brought tea. And along with the servants, Julia entered with a bouquet of delicate roses with a smile on her face. The Duke guessed that the girl must have been helping the gardener today, and he allowed her to collect a bouquet. The girl pressed the flowers to her chest and glowed with pleasure. The servant spoke into the master's ear that since he was partial to flowers, the girl wanted to take them to his office. Glenn was surprised by this statement of his preferences, but the servant said that at least the girl thought so. The servant said that the gentleman himself walked with the girl every day in the garden, so she thought so. Meanwhile, Julia was putting cut roses in a vase. Glenn insisted that he walked in the garden with her simply because she liked it, but then it suddenly dawned on him. He asked his assistant how he knew all this. He explained, I learned everything from Julia herself. She could explain everything intelligently with gestures, and it turned out that she was quite successful in this, so they haven't had any problems with understanding yet. Glenn insisted that this was great news. He only felt sorry that they were the only ones who didn't have problems, and he became sad. The blonde covered his mouth to hide the chuckle that escaped him. Julia looked at everything with eyes full of surprise. Glenn looked at the girl with love and tenderness. When she noticed his gaze on her, she timidly bowed to him. The employee said that she had not yet finished with her duties, so he asked them to postpone their tea party a little. The Duke agreed. Our heroine was glad that Mr. Glenn smiled at her. She took this to mean that he liked flowers after all, and I was glad that I thought of bringing him a bouquet. She was already wondering what to do with her time before tea, but she was brought out of her thoughts by the sight of a maid carrying a basket of laundry. The maid asked the girl if she would like to help her. 
Our heroine responded by holding out her hands to pick up the sheets and smiling in response. When she was already carrying the laundry, she thought that the servants of the Duke of Vestris were completely different. They were not like those who work at the Lafayette estate. Here the servants did not get angry, did not shout or hit. They were always calm and smiling. The girl thought that the people here must be so kind because she was a guest here, and they even learned to understand her by gestures. And Mr. Glenn himself seemed to have completely predicted her course of thoughts, and that's why our heroine felt so good here. But she understood that she could not stay here forever. After all, Mr. Camille must have been going crazy with worry. And if she decides to get close to the servants of the House of Vastris only because of their kindness, then she will thereby betray Master Camille. Julia was thinking about the guy. She disappeared so suddenly he probably didn't know what to think, and she wanted to give him a sign that everything was fine with her. But Julia was so afraid to return to that house, and yet she so wanted to see Mr. Camille, that envious cook, the evil mistress and the cruel and unpredictable Gregory. The girl was so scared. She told herself that she had to be braver, at least for Mr. Camille's sake. After all, he cared so much about her, and even those confessions of his feelings. Julia sat on the garden path and was deep in thought, but then a girl in a chic blue dress approached her and addressed her insultingly, calling her a mongrel. The pink-haired FIFA imperiously asked Julia if she was the mongrel that Glenn picked up. Our heroine looked at the stranger in surprise. I thought that she was so beautiful, that at first glance it was clear that she was an aristocrat. Julia fell to her knees and began to bow at her feet. Her long, dark hair spilled over the slabs of the garden path. The lady said that the girl was picked up like a dog, and she had the nerve to think that she could stay here as long as she liked. And it remained to be seen whether she considered Glenn's kindness limitless, or she was just trying to take advantage of the opportunity. The lady in the blue dress deliberately stepped on Julia's hand with her heel, creating a painful wound on it. She said that tramps like her did not belong here. The foot in a shoe with high and sharp heels ended up on our heroine's head. There was an unpleasant wheezing sound, and she thought that after all, Mr. Glenn shouldn't have spoiled her like that. The arrogant person ordered the girl to raise her head. Julia looked at her with guilty eyes, and she announced that her name was Ophelia de Arcadia. The skinny girl was confused. After all, that was the name of their kingdom, and only members of the ruling family bore such a surname. She couldn't believe that this was the princess of the kingdom, and she declared that Glenn was her future husband. And since the girl decided to stick to a man, she should have remembered that it didn't cost the princess anything to kill someone like her. The lady asked if the guest understood what she was getting at. Julia stood timidly on her knees in front of her and nodded her head. The princess asked her to thank her for her condescension, turned sharply and left. And Julia, sitting on the garden path, tried to realize that Mrs. Ophelia would become Glenn's wife. The man, after all, bore the title of duke, and of course he already had a bride in mind, but she couldn't understand why her heart was so heavy. The maid asked Julia in surprise when she saw her what happened to her. The girl shuddered. She assumed that she had fallen, and she suggested quickly treating these wounds. She took the girl by the hand and led her with her, and Julia was surprised that the people at the Vestris estate were so kind to her, and she didn't want to keep causing them problems. The Duke's assistant thanked the man. He said that was all and Julia was sitting in the cart next to empty boxes and barrels for exchange. She thought that even if she left here, she would still not be able to return to the Lafayette estate. Yes, she didn't even know where it was, and even if she somehow miraculously made it to Judas, the mistress would not allow her to stay there. And there was something else. Gregory, with his aggression and appearances in her closet, an unfriendly servant, Julia realized that she really wanted to see Mr. Camille, but she was very afraid to go to that house again. The servant said that the girl suddenly disappeared. The duke clarified what this even meant. He said that he was very sorry. All the servants were ordered to search, but so far there was no news. Glenn clarified who last saw the girl. The maid immediately responded. He asked her if she had noticed anything suspicious. She assured that in fact the girl had an abrasion, and when she encountered the girl, she was sitting in the garden and seemed to be looking into space. There were scratches on her forehead and near her nose, so she immediately rushed to treat the girl's wounds, and she asked if she had fallen, and received only a nod in response. But the thing was that it all seemed strange. After all, if she fell, she could really hurt her face, but the back of her hand was also damaged. It was impossible to get such a wound from a fall. Her hand seemed to be crushed under the heel of a woman's shoe. Glenn thought about it. This could not have been the work of the stepmother. After all, he was now a duke, and she would not risk going openly against his will. But today... Ophelia unexpectedly showed up to visit him without an invitation or any apparent reason. And now she was already capable of doing anything. 
and it turned out that it was because of her that Julia decided to leave the estate. The covered wagon was parked in a dark alley. The lanterns on the houses illuminated it poorly. The girl looked out carefully and decided to climb out. She looked around cautiously. Ambiguous sounds were heard from around the corner. Curiosity made her look there. There, a couple in an erotic pose received pleasure from the proximity of their bodies. Julia quickly turned around, scared that she might have been noticed. The girl was surprised how they could think of making love right on the street. She began to run away without looking back wherever her eyes looked. But at some point, she ran into an unfamiliar man. He called out to her and ordered her to watch where she was going from now on. Julia tried to communicate with him using gestures. The man did not understand anything from her gestures. He was surprised that there were young people here too. Silent horror froze in the girl's eyes. He said that this is how he went to the brothel and did not sleep with whores from the street. It infuriated him that they were always so grimy. The stranger grabbed Yulia by the elbow and ordered her to obediently go with him. The girl was amazed that he thought such a thing about her. But then a familiar voice called her name. The man was clearly familiar to her, but there was unusual anxiety and aggression in that voice. She pressed herself against the wall. There was a powerful impact sound and blood sprayed out. Tears appeared in Julia's eyes. Camille stood before her in the starlight. Another man on horseback rode through the streets of the city on horseback. He wondered where the girl could have gone. It was the same Duke of Glen Westris. His hair was tousled, his lips were compressed, and his gaze was anxious. Meanwhile, Camille was glad that he had found Julia. She looked into his eyes devotedly, not believing her happiness. The guy insisted that he was looking for her like that. He gently touched her face and continued to speak kind words to her. The girl, even having the opportunity to speak, could not find words of joy. The guy began to hug her. He was sure that the girl must have been very scared. He assured that everything would be fine now. Julia asked what would happen to that man now, looking back at the stranger lying motionless on the road nearby. Camille assured her with a smile on his face that he was indeed a little rude to him. But his blow was not too strong and he had to come to his senses soon. But it was better for them to leave here as soon as possible. After all, when that man wakes up, they could suddenly get into trouble. The guy picked up the light girl in his arms, and she even gasped in surprise. And he carried her further in his arms, the girl protested. She assured Mr. Camille that she could get there herself. But he assured that she was trembling all over, and he will protect her. I asked her not to worry so much. And on the slabs of that road, the man's body remained lying in a pool of his own blood. Camille, meanwhile, put the girl on horseback in front of him. He asked her where she had been all this time. She mumbled something inaudible in response to him over her shoulder. The guy said that when she was kicked out of the estate, she was seriously injured. And now she was wearing clean and new clothes, and her wounds seemed to have completely healed. Julia answered, fortunately for her, she then ended up at the estate of Duke Vestris. Camille asked about Duke Vestris. The girl assured that he found her on the road and took her with him, and he was incredibly kind to her all the time. Camille, out of emotion and jealousy, only squeezed the reins of his horse with force. He wondered how, in this case, Julia ended up in this place. After all, the Vestris estate was quite far away. Julia hesitated. She shared that she just didn't think those people should care about her forever. The guy was surprised that she really left without telling anyone anything. She confirmed this with a sad face. She told how she snuck into the cart of the merchant who was leaving the estate. He reproached her for that. She said that she was perfectly aware of everything, but she didn't know at all how to explain why she wanted to leave. And even if she could, they still wouldn't let her go. Julia realized that she had not even thanked them in the end, and she acted ungratefully, but she could not continue to stay there precisely because the people there were kind to her. And the Duke of Glen himself too. Feet in luxurious shoes stood on the threshold of the mansion, and the floorboards creaked. The man was sad. Glenn asked his assistant if they had found anything. He replied that there was nothing, not a clue. He recalled how, as a child, a girl called him brother, and reproached him for never telling her his name. And now it turned out that this girl also decided to suddenly disappear from his life, just like the one from his childhood memories. The Lafayette estate stood in the darkness of the night. The guy confidently and purposefully carried the fragile girl towards him. Julia pressed her whole body against him. At some point, she began to assure Mr. Camille that she could reach her hut alone. The guy assured her that now she couldn't go there anymore, and it even became dangerous. Julia asked where I should live then, if not there. Camille approached the mansion without answering the girl's questions. She said that she could not sleep in the same place as the gentleman. The guy asks her to keep her voice down. The girl covered her mouth with her hands. He assured her that she had nothing to worry about. 
but he just wanted to avoid all possible troubles. Camille quickly carried the girl along, trying to move as quietly as possible, and she in turn covered her mouth with her hands. But no matter how hard the guy tried, they were still noticed by Gregory. He also tried to remain unnoticed, so Camille was unaware, and a pair of eyes were watching them with malice. The guy approached the steps that led down to the basement. He took the door key from his neck. Skillfully, with one hand, he turned the key in the lock. It clicked easily. Camille touched his hand to the painted glass on the small shield. The wall itself began to move to the side, letting us inside. The guy, pleased with himself and the impression he had made on the girl, carried her in his arms deeper into the room. Julia looked around with surprise and apprehension. Under the wall, there was a wooden bed with a scarlet and short canopy. She asked Mr. Camille where they were. The guy gently caressed her hair and neck, looked into her sad eyes. He looked at her with such tenderness. Soon a metal collar with a chain was fastened around the girl's neck. He said he looked just great. Oh, kissed her forehead tenderly. Camille said that what is dear to the heart must be hidden where it is certain that it will not be found. Julia did not understand his words. The girl was lying on the bed, blindfolded and her hands tangled behind her back. Around her neck was the same metal collar and a rope tied to it. The door creaked. Mr. Camille appeared on the threshold. He smiled sweetly and welcomingly, and in his hands was a tray with fresh and warm food. The guy asked if Julia behaved well. 